had, we've had some IT issues, but we, I think we've sorted that out now, and hopefully everybody um, everybody is able to join the meeting virtually as well as in the room. Um, I need to let you know that we are recording this meeting um, with the idea to send it around for uh, comms and media. Uh, for the attendees in the room, um, there will be photos taken as well. If you don't want to have your photo taken, Alison is at the front here. She might migrate to the back in a minute. Um, please let her know. And um, for online attendees, um, please can I ask you to make sure that you are muted um, throughout the majority of this meeting. There will be a section in the middle for question and answers whereupon you can unmute yourself. But for now, please remain muted. Um, right, let's begin. Slides. So, um, welcome to everybody, both in the room and virtually. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you all here today to discuss the space group proposal. Um, about a year ago, I approached the IOP to um, uh, propose that we should have a special interest group focusing on space. And I'm really pleased to announce that the IOP are absolutely enthralled with the idea. And uh, it's been maybe a year in the making, but we were finally having our first event, which is this town hall meeting. And uh, if this event is a success, which I think it will be, the IOP will uh, sign us into existence as an official special interest group focusing on space. Um, in front of you, you have um, the agenda. So uh, we're on the welcome section now. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We are not expecting any fire bell alarms testing today. So if there is a, a fire alarm, it's genuine. Um, just follow me out the building. Um, and then we'll have opening remarks by uh, D, Dr. D. Lodia. Um, so you can come to the front. Yeah, no? yeah perfect. And um, uh, she'll discuss for um, maybe 10 minutes about um, statistics in the space industry, uh, breaking down how uh, you can employment statistics and figures, as well as the draws and um, pulls that people feel that are attracted to the, the space industry. Um, then we'll move on to the bulk of the presentation, which is about the, the town hall discussion. I'll um, talk about my the, the mission statement of this group. Uh, we'll introduce the committee members, or proposed committee members at this point, as we don't formally exist as a group yet. Um, an overview of what the space group hopes to achieve, and then we'll have the Q&A session. Um, so at that point, we'll take questions from the room and from the Zoom um, as well. And then at the end, we'll be having our guest speaker, Professor John Broom from the University of Exeter um, for some closing remarks. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to uh, Dr. D. Lodia. Thank you very much. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, those of you who made it here in person and hello to everyone who is online. Um, so my name is Dee and uh, what I want to do just to kick off this, this meeting, just kind of set the scene really, like why is space important? Um, and, you know, looking at where we can go with it, why we need a space group in the first place. So when we were kids, we were all asked, that all important question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And usually the answer was, I want to be an astronaut. However, nowadays the answers are slightly different. So kids want to be, you know, other things now. So what I want to do is kick off with a, uh, a little quiz. Okay, so what you can see here on this slide is, um, it's a survey that was carried out uh, in three countries, the US, UK and China. And kids were asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? They were given a choice of five professions. So we have blogger slash YouTuber, teacher, professional athlete, musician, and an astronaut. So started off, um, we've got the answers from the kids from the USA. Uh, you can see that the most 
popular choice was blogger slash YouTuber. The second most popular choice was to be a teacher. Next, to be an athlete. After that, musician. And then the least popular answer was to be an astronaut. So what I would like to do is um, ask everyone to maybe just have a guess. What do you think the answers are for those children that were asked in the UK? So, um, and I, I would like people who are online as well to get involved. So, you know, if you are, if you do have access to the chat function, please feel free to type in. So which of these five professions do you think was the most popular answer from the UK? Feel free to, to shout out and, and type in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's have a look. Yes, you're right. It was the most popular one. Um, which one do you think was the least popular? Teacher. <laughs> <laughs> no hesitation there. Um, actually, it was astronaut, unfortunately. Um, and strangely enough, the trend was very, very similar. Um, now on to China. So uh, I don't know if you remember the game, Bruce's Price is Right, uh, where you have to choose higher or lower, um, but let's go with vlogger and YouTuber. Do you think that that was more popular or less popular than what the US and the UK said? Just say higher or lower. Lower. Well, they're not allowed any. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's lower. Um, how about being a teacher, do you think? More popular or less popular, higher or lower? Higher. higher. Oh, yeah. Wow. Much, much higher, yeah. Um, professional athlete, higher or lower? Lower. Oh. So a little bit higher. Um, how about a musician? Lower. Yeah. Oh. Uh, higher. Yeah, higher. And how about astronaut? Do you think? Oh, that's a bit higher, isn't it? <laughs> Let's have a look. Wow. Much higher. Yeah. So very, very different. But also it does depend on, you know, the, the actual country as well, what kind of things are promoted, um, you know, the, the children's <laughs> education. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, now, thinking about, you know, why, why are kids, you know, giving these sorts of answers as well? If we look at what sort of influences people have had, those people who work in the space um, industry, in the space sector, uh, what different influences did they have? So this is another survey where people who work in the space sector, they were asked this. And, you know, we have all sorts of things varying from events and books, TV, visits to museums, maybe, you know, personal connection, met an astronaut, all sorts of different things. At the top, it is basically events, books, historic space events as well. Now this graph also splits up the answers between men and women. And actually there isn't too much of um, variance between men and women. Um, but what you do find is that men are more influenced by things like you know, the TV and the internet, whereas women, uh, it's usually a school or a teacher that inspires them to go into the space sector or indeed space camp. And um, for me, it was space camp. So just a little bit of a background to, to my, my story. Um, I, when I was trying to decide what to study at university, I turned around to my parents and said, I would like to study astrophysics. And their response was, well, what kind of a job can you get with that? They didn't really understand. My family are from an Indian background. And I was one of the first people in my family to actually go to university. So my parents didn't understand or have the, the kind of support or guidance to then help me. Luckily, my school was able to support me. And it was during my A-levels that one of my, well, my physics teacher said, why don't you go to space camp? So they arranged for me to go and spend a week uh, at Brunel University. Um, and there I was able to find out you know, all the different kinds of things that you could do in a space related, related you know, um, sort of work, you know, all the different types of jobs you can get, all the different skills that you need. And that basically cemented it for me. So I went off to university, studied physics with astrophysics at University of Birmingham. 
And then I went on to do a PhD in gravitational wave detection. So I kind of took a slightly diagonal um, journey. I wanted to go a bit more into experimental physics. So here we go. Um, the two pictures you can see there on in the middle and the left hand side, those are the two advanced LIGO gravitational wave detectors. They are both based in the US. And um, the picture on the right, that's just uh, one of the uh, mirror pendulums that sit inside those detectors. So these detectors are L-shaped and each arm is four kilometers long. Uh, you've got very powerful lasers that are just bouncing back and forth and it's full of mirrors like these ones here and they are about 40 centimeters in diameter. They are the smoothest man-made things in the world at the moment. Um, and I helped develop uh, some of the sensors that are sitting just at the top of that, that mirror pendulum suspension there. And I finished my PhD in 2013. Um, LIGO was upgraded to the second generation, advanced LIGO. It was, you know, my sensors were installed, lots of other things were upgraded, improved. When it was finally switched back on again, um, it detected gravitational waves for the first time. So 100 years after Einstein first predicted them, they were detected directly in 2015, confirmed in 2016. And I was very lucky to be um, called onto BBC, BBC Breakfast and um, I was interviewed about them. So that was a very, very exciting time in my life. And of course, as you can imagine, my parents were super, super proud. Yeah. <laughs> but they're still trying to figure out what it was that I did and what I do. But, you know, um, since then, I went into science communication. So the aspect of being a role model, trying to get bring this excitement back into children again, it really, you know, struck a chord in me. I wanted to be that person, you know, the person that I really could have done with when I was younger. But like I said, luckily I had teachers and people. So I wanted to go into science communication. I um, worked as an education communicator at um, We The Curious in Bristol. It was called at Bristol Science Centre. Uh, I've had the privilege of being able to um, be a science team leader at the Abu Dhabi International Science Festival. Um, and that is not the real Tim Peak, in case you haven't noticed. That's just cobble cut out. But I, I've been very fortunate to have some really amazing experiences and to just pa pass on my passion for space. So, talking about role models, um, we all know Brian Cox here. Um, he started something interesting, which was breaking the mold of what a typical physicist looks like. He made science cool, okay? And this was known as the Brian Cox effect. Uh, and what that means is that at the time that he, you know, started making more and more media appearances, um, there was a massive boom in A-level maths and, you know, science applications, um, lots and lots of people wanting to study physics at university, at University of Manchester, where he was based at the time, um, there was a 52% increase in physics course applications. So there you go, the Brian Cox effect. Um, but we've had lots of other things and events, people. Um, so we've got Tim Peake was um, selected as the first British ESA astronaut in 2009, went up to the ISS in December 2015. Uh, that got lots and lots of children very interested in space, very curious, very keen, and also the general public as well. So, you know, um, adults. Uh, so, yeah, ev everyone was uh, was on the journey there with him. Um, but we've also had some amazing things from SpaceX. OK, so they are pushing the boundaries of science. Essentially, we've got uh, NASA's Artemis uh, missions to the moon. Okay, so going back to the moon again, lots of amazing things that are happening here. And we want to do this. We've got this momentum now that we really can help uh, children with, you know, getting interested in space again. Uh, another key milestone was the development of the UK Space Agency. So that was formed in 2010. Um, but one thing that I do want to mention is when we think of space, it's not just about being an astronaut. Okay, there are lots and lots of jobs that are in the space sector. And, you know, ESA as well, They when they do recruit, they are trying to, 
you know, um, stress that it isn't just about astronauts. There are lots of other people, lots of other skills that are involved in the space sector. And it's not just about, you know, launching rockets and things, but it's all of the spin-off technologies as well. So, um, you know, things like memory foam and cochlear implants, firefighting equipment, all those kind of things as spin-off from um, space technology, essentially. Now, um, this graph basically shows what people working in the space sector, um, what happens to the pay really? So you can see that there is this, this bit in the middle where you know, you've know you spent some quite a few years working in the space sector, you're still building up your skills, your experience, but the pay isn't quite reflecting that. So it's within this square that people are then tempted to leave. And unfortunately, we also find that those people who did, may not have studied you know, um, anything related to do with space, but they want to make that switch and come and work in the space sector, well, there's not very much support there either. So actually, maybe this is an area that we need to tap into and support those kind of people. Um, so coming back to people who work in the space sector, when asked why they want to work in space, well, um, it's definitely not because of the pay, but it's because they find the work interesting, okay? And they, they enjoy space. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very, very evident there. Another thing as well, um, so this is, you know, com coming back to the pay, um, average salaries in the space sector are obviously higher in the south of England. And this also is because of where the space industries and space organisations are located. 60% of them are located in London and the south of England. It would be really nice if we can, you know, make space more accessible to those to those other areas there so how can people get involved um you can be a citizen scientist okay so there's something called zooniverse you can do lots of different types of volunteering as well but actually we we just want to give people more of a chance to get involved but we need to bring this excitement back we need to get adults to understand you know why space is important and if their child is you know interested in space how you know they can help them where to find resources and this is why it's really really important that we need to set up a space group in the IOP and you know so many different areas that we can focus on these are just some of them but first of all academia is different career routes uh, opportunities for volunteering uh, government and policy as well and of course public outreach Okay, so it's really, really important that we kind of bring science back into the limelight. Lots of things going on, you know, with um, the launch in uh, at the Spaceball in Cornwall. You know, there, there's so much momentum at the moment. And let's sort of keep that going and um, push for, for space and bring that interest back. And just as a final slide, I will just leave this up there. But thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Dee. Um, just I've met the last couple of people that have been in the waiting room. So um, that was the opening remarks for the space group proposal. We'll now um, progress to the um, motivation for the space group. So um, the Global space industry is, is predicted $1 trillion of growth by 2040. Um, I don't know if that's a current statistic, that was a pre-pandemic statistic, maybe it's slightly smaller now, but um, the, the overarching theme is that space is a growing industry, it's a growing sector, and um, that's, that's all over the world. And uh, the UK government has spearheaded space as a potential growth opportunity for us. Um, on on a, another level, I also note that um, the IOP has lots of special interest groups, but um, from in my own background, I moved from uh, nuclear to space, and when I did, I found that there was sort of a gap in the portfolio of the IOP special interest groups um, reflecting career choices that I had made, so I decided to make a group. <laughs> um, and I see this as um, analogous to other um, special interest groups that the IOP already has. 
the, for example, the IOP has uh, a nuclear industry group, and I think that this this proposal is going to focus on maybe similar topics, but but space related. Um, we have a mission statement. Um, the mission statement, I'll read it to you now, is promoting, uh, representing and connecting um, interested parties within the space domain. So when I say promoting, I'm talking about um, creating that platform for ideation and collaboration across the space industry. And when I'm talking about representing, it's about representing um, people maybe with a physics background that maybe work in a related field in the space industry that aren't represented by any other group. And uh, connecting is all about knowledge sharing and networking between those interested parties. Uh, and when we're talking about interested parties, it, it's not just astronauts as we have just spoken about. There's loads of um, industries that, that are gonna be springing up around the space domain. Uh, so we, we're talking about individuals, but also academia, businesses, government representatives, um, and maybe even amateur astronomers, photographers as well. Um, space isn't just for science and it isn't just for engineering. It's also, there's there's careers in law, there's careers in um, admin, there's, career, there's all sorts of um, interested parties we're expecting to be um, on board with this. Um, so we move on to the part of the presentation where I am going to be introducing myself and also um, the people who have joined me on this journey to be on this committee with me um, are, are also going to introduce themselves. Um, so firstly, my name is Alex Davis. It's been <laughs> we've been in this meeting for half an hour. I haven't actually said my name yet. My name is Alex Davis. I work as a systems engineer at RAL Space. And uh, my background is in physics. Um, I uh, graduated from the University of Surrey in 2013 with a, a bachelor in physics, but I've migrated to engineering, as is a, a common theme in many people's careers to migrate across many different STEM subjects. Um, so I currently work on two projects, 50% um, on each. Uh, one of them is called the Aerial Project, which is um, a satellite that will be measuring planetary exoplanet uh, transits across stars and um, using infrared spectrometry to measure the chemical composition of those atmospheres. So you'd be able to categorize your, your planets by the chemistry that's happening on their, on their atmospheres. And the second one is, is SPECTRE, which um, will demonstrate orbit to ground transmission of entangled photons to develop new technologies. Um, in particular, um, quantum cryptography technology. So this is all about sending data in a really secure way. Um, and obviously my professional interests, I'm, I'm trying to create this group and I'm excited to learn more about being um, a systems engineer in the space domain. Um, next, uh, do you need me to come up? Can you to come up to that? Yeah, I think you might have to be on this side of the convenient partition. <laughs> So hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm currently working as an instrument environment scientist, also at Lowell Space, and I'm part of something called the Disruptive Space Technology Center. I also work on the SPECTRE project, and for me, most of my time is on that project. Um, Alex already said a little bit about what it does, but for me, I'm particularly involved with some of the optical testing and the magnetic testing, and also in building up our ground station at Chilbolton. In my spare time, um, I work with Women in Aerospace Europe, where I've recently been part of a working group looking at improving the visibility of female experts in the space sector. So we published a white paper and we're now working on other ways we can help improve increased visibility. And I'm also part of the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, we organised an event back in April, which was really good fun. And I like doing other outreach as well, um, including trying to get sort of demystify the university applications process a little bit for students who wouldn't normally get a chance to go back to the university. Um, next we have yeah. Yeah. Okay, here. Yeah, you are. Yeah, so uh, I'm Rick Lamore. Uh, so I'm currently a, a senior systems engineer at MDA UK. Um, so we do uh, space robotics and sensors. Um, I 
have uh, over 10 years uh, working in on technology developments and uh, flight hardware for, for projects in the space industry. Uh, I started here at RAL uh, working on uh, many magnetospheres uh, for human spaceflight, um, and then moved on to doing um, all the engineering side of, of space. So uh, technology development for a lot of European space agency projects, um, looking at things like uh, window design for human space flights, uh, analysis for different uh, interplanetary missions, um, various uh, sort of multi-physics kind of applications uh, in technology. Um, and I guess, uh, like Alex, I kind of felt that there wasn't really a home for me within the IOP, uh, aside from enjoying the articles in the magazine every month. Um, and I think uh, sort of making this group uh, will benefit a lot of people like me who've been on the engineering side, maybe didn't really feel like the IOP was a place that they should kind of get into, um, but we could really benefit from being in the same room with people on the more scientific side and uh, sort of getting some of that cross-contamination of ideas um, and developing some technologies in the future. So looking forward to that. And um, next, you know, if you come over to the mic, sorry. Hi everyone, it's me again. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I am Dipali Lodia, just feel free to call me D. Um, I'm currently a public engagement manager at uh, UKRI, so that's UK Research and Innovation. Uh, so in the public engagement team, we manage programs for uh, universities and different organizations, um, different industries as well, and also including the IOP. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really exciting uh, sort of role that I'm that I'm involved in. Uh, one of the sort of most exciting projects uh, that I'm currently working on is um, this digital gaming uh, platform. Um, so we we provided funding for this project where we asked someone to to come up with some sort of digital game that will help um, raise climate aware, um, climate change awareness in young people. And so what they did was they uh, used motion capture and CGI and then created this amazing interactive story where the audience can basically decide which way the story goes and evolves. So they make the decisions as to how the story is played out. Uh, so using, you know, all sorts of technology, but also you know, teaching them about climate change as well. So that was a, a really, really nice project I've been involved in. Of course, my background, like I said before, um, I did uh, gravitational wave detection. Um, I was also a science communicator at We The Curious and also working at the International Science Festival in Abu Dhabi. Um, my professional interests, so um, I'm just joining the, the Physics Communicators Committee, which I'm really excited about. Um, obviously supporting the, the space group as well uh, to set it up. Um, also working as a STEM ambassador. And if you are wondering about that uh, picture while I'm trying to keep the poor astronaut, that, that's one of my favorite pictures. Um, it involves two of my, my loves in life, space and Taekwondo, but that's a whole other story. Um, so yeah, I'm fully, fully supporting uh, this uh, group for the space and we definitely have a need for it. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, next we have um, Vivian. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, so I'm Vivian. I'm an engineer by training, but I'm also a scientist by practice. I am interested in system design, computer vision, machine learning, but somehow the projects I do are in the physics domain. So I've been a data scientist at CLF. Um, I automated a system for a high energy laser that the UK is going to deliver to the Czech Republic, for example. Um, I am a science communicator, and I'm going to start my PhD in space and laser communications. And basically, my goals for the next years would be to eventually be a chartered engineer, stay involved in experimental research. I like getting my hands dirty, but I feel like I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, science communication, especially in space and STEM in general, because I do not have good foundation in space. I just keep bouncing. And I'm basically here because I really like space. Somehow <laughs> I ended up here. And I would like for people to have like um, a group that they could go to or say, hey, that, there's a space group or something like that. So I really want to support this group. And obviously to finish my PhD is one of my biggest skills. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Um, Emily, yeah, you're fine. All right, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I'm also, like Rebecca, an instrument development scientist in the Disruptive Space Technology Centre here at RAL Space. Before that, I did a, a degree and a PhD in physics. Um, I work on a few different projects here. I also work on the SPECTRE project for demonstrating quantum key distribution. I do some work trying to measure sky brightness at potential sites for satellite optical ground stations. I'm currently trying to learn FPGA programming, which is, which is quite different and quite fun as well. And um, so, yes, I'm very excited to, to have this group within the IOP. It's something that I was involved in as a student and it's sort of let drop, I suppose, as I've, as I've started my career. So very much looking forward to that. And uh, Marco? Hello, everyone. I'm Marco, and um, I'm the director and chief technology officer of a company based in Harvard Campus that is a grown up startup. So, I'm a physicist. My background is uh, I did a PhD in Earth observation in Italy, and uh, as a result of that PhD, we developed together with our, with our team in the company. Um, a methodology for calculating solar exposure at ground. And from that result, we decided to create a startup company, a spin out of my original company in Italy that is based now here at uh, inside RAL. And what we do, we apply, we use uh, satellite data for measuring the uh, solar exposure of people in real time and provide uh, um, basically medical or healthcare services like mobile apps for preventing some burn or uh, telemedicine of skin cancer using the light from remote and in collaboration with the public health England, that is now UK USA, and um, with the European Space Agency, UK Space Agency, and the NHS. So um, as you can see, these are just some pictures of the type of apps that we do, mobile apps for personalized sun protection or telemedicine. And uh, I, the moment I saw this group, I said, wow, that's great news. And I said it immediately to Alex because I think that I can second totally what uh, Rick said. I was part of the IOP, I've been part of the IOP for the last two years, but uh, I felt that, uh, you know, it's such a great organization, but there was not a specific place for me, for space industry, right away, for physicists working in space and in an industrial environment. So I think that this group uh, is absolutely a brilliant idea. I'm very, I'm proud to support it and to be part of this proposed committee. And of course, what I would like to do as I brought in my professional interest, I would like to be helpful for the group and for the IOP in general to, uh, for supporting the uh, development also of the relationship between academia and the industry, also to provide opportunities for young researchers in this, uh, in particular in the applied space sector, like in applications that are based on space technology. That's me. Thank you very much. Great. So, um... Moving on to what the space group hopes to achieve, you've met most of the committee members at this point. Not everybody was able to be here in this room. There are a couple of the people who um, haven't been able to present, but that's this is most people. And as you can see, there are um, people from many different aspects of the space domain who are all coming together to agree that this is this is needed. This is um, there's a lot of momentum behind this now. Um, but what the space group um, aims to do, um, for a start uh, on the committee, the, the IOP has a very um, similar structure of committees um, across all the different special interest groups. So normally it's broken down with a chair, treasurer, secretary, um, with uh, numerous ordinary members. Um, and occasionally a special interest group might carve out a specific uh, role that they will identify that is important to them. And um, I have uh, carved out two roles, which I think will be important in the space group. And one of them is the communications representative and the other one is the outreach representative. So the communications representative, I'm expecting to be somebody who will promote us on social media because as, um, Many special interest groups focus on um, attending conferences and uh, hosting webinars and seminars, and this is very important work. But if we are to maximize our audience, it would be beneficial to be able to talk 
you know, to everybody on the internet as well. So I'm hoping that we can have a social media presence to maximize our, our potential audience. And the outreach representative, I'm expecting to um, run school-based events. So um, in, um, you know, people's childhoods in growing up, a lot of um, parents might think, might, might have this idea that physics is not a very practical subject to study. But as we have heard from, from Dee's opening remarks, um, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and I think that having these outreach events at schools will, will help bring the space domain to the, the future of our industry, which will be the next generation of children, of, of students um, becoming scientists and engineers. So um, in terms of committee, uh, that's our proposed uh, breakdown of committee positions. Um, positions haven't officially been allocated yet because we have not, um, we don't exist as a group yet. Um, so, yes. Um, in terms of meeting format, um, we're expecting to have an AGM once a year and to meet once a year in person as well. Um, we are scattered all over the UK. Um, the most southern group of people on the committee are um, as far south as Exeter and, and most northern are as far north as uh, Nottingham or Leicester. So um, most of our meetings on this committee I'm expecting to be um perhaps online maybe via zoom um but in order to keep the engagement up um we're also hoping to do a bit of agile working and that that has already taken place we already have a, a direct chat platform where we're, we're actually messaging quite regularly and exchanging ideas on well so far on on this event this town hall meeting but also hopefully on future events that we'll be able to to run once once we're signed into existence um, and so what we're hoping to achieve is actually quite a lot. There's a lot that you can do with a group like this. Um, I've put five bullet points here, but that's not an exhaustive list. Um, so I, I've got supporting people from disadvantaged backgrounds in physics related careers. And what I meant by that was it, we could perhaps offer maybe a bursary um, for people from a disadvantaged background to attend maybe some space related training or some space related event um, in order to help them in their, their careers. Or um, another point that came up consistently time and time again was mentoring um, in that people um, wanting access into the space industry, not necessarily um, as uh, students and as children, but even people transferring from another field entirely, um, mentoring came up again and again. Of course, we'll be running our webinars and seminars as all special interest groups tend to do. Um, and we're hoping to have a presence at various conferences. I put the Appleton Space Conference here, but there are other conferences as well such as the um, RAL Early Careers Conference as well. And um, we're also interested in collaborating with other special interest groups that are already in existence. So um, for example, um, I can see potential collaborations on the horizon with um, the BIGQ group, so that's Business Innovation and Growth, their quantum subgroup. Um, and the reason I say that is because they uh, there's a lot of overlap between quantum and space um, and the industries and the, the industrial applications that um, those that, that overlapping skill set um, entails. And we're also interested in um, so I, I've highlighted that one special interest group, but there are countless others. I have I have spoken to other um, chairs of other groups as well. Um, and we're also keen to have collaborations with other professional institutions outside of the IOP. So, um, for example, we have contacted already um, UK SEDS, which is the UK Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, 
We have also already contacted um, SGAC, which is the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, we're actively pursuing collaborations with the Royal Aeronautical Society. And we are also looking to have um, a, a collaboration on the Limitless campaign, which is the IOP's campaign for um, uh, making physics careers more accessible to um, students at school. So we've got a lot on and we're really excited to be able to start delivering on some of these um, activities. Um, we, uh, next. Right, we have now uh, reached the section where we have um, questions and answers about the, the space group proposal. So um, anybody in the room, please um, shout out your question and also anybody online, um, if you can unmute yourself and uh, if you have any questions about the space group and what you have heard so far, we'll give that a few minutes, we'll let the questions trickle in. Yes. Shall I come to the front? Oh yeah, if you, if you, it's, yeah. I think that's it's on the microphone. Okay. So thanks so much. It's been really so interesting to, to hear from everybody and your different motivations for starting the group. And as a non-space physicist, I'm really enthused by, by listening to you all. But I was also really touched by the comments of a, a couple of you about how this would help you find a home. Um, to have a group like this in the Institute of Physics. <laughs> so I wondered if there was anything specific that you had in mind that the Institute of Physics could help you with. I think for me, it, it, it's, uh, as I was saying before, it, it's it's kind of getting, getting in the same room as people who are maybe non-space, but doing a lot of really interesting things um, that we could, potentially incorporate into space applications um, and in terms of growing the industrial side a bit more. Uh, so yeah, working on collaborations that can, we can maybe apply things. Cause sometimes you're working on things on the ground that you don't necessarily think might have the benefit in space, I guess. And those of us who have been working in space might see a different twist or whatever that, that could be applied. That's exciting. <laughs> On the reverse, so having the as a, as a pure scientist to, to actually have a group which brings you into proper contact with engineers on concepts and things that are are are, are, are very uh, early on, uh, and it, t it tends to be that the engineers will only be involved when everything is all very solid and and, and determined. Uh, so it's an opportunity for those kind of engineers, uh, imagination, I think, and aspirations for things that are more interesting to have a, 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 a meeting place with scientists who are looking for their skills to, to interact with. So I think it's very valuable. We do have a couple of questions coming in online. The first person is JCZ, I'm sorry, I, I don't see a full name. Go ahead, JCZ. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, yeah, so my name's John Zarnecki. Uh, I'm a retired oh. uh, space scientist. Um, yeah, thanks to everybody for some very interesting thoughts and presentations. Um, I do have a few comments. Uh, one of the uh, presenters, I think it was D, um, sort of concentrated on the domains, but not what I would call the space domains, things like academia, government, industry, and so forth. But I think it's also important to think about the different space domains, because space has so many different uh, domains. And by that, I mean the space science, there's the space engineering, there's... Um, Earth observation, so using space just to, as a platform to look down. Um, and, and then there are people who use space data, but actually have no knowledge or even interest 
per se in space, but they use the data acquired from space. So I think we need to think about all of those different aspects. And I presume I might be wrong that we'd want to include all of those branches. But, you know, they are quite different, aren't they? And then there's also space exploration. So rather than just, you know, boringly going round and round the Earth, actually going to interesting places like Mars and Saturn, for example. So I think, you know, that is is a subject that is worth um, talking about. And um, I, I don't know if you saw my comment. Um, I did notice that the committee looked horribly not diverse, if that's the right expression. I mean, horribly young if I might say so. Um, and as a member of the IOP's EDI committee, I would flag that, you know, we should try and uh, represent uh, the IOP in that respect. And also, please tell me if I'm wrong, but it did seem very RAL stroke Harwell um, heavy. And though some of my best friends are at RAL, uh, I do think we should look at broadening uh, that aspect. That's enough yeah. for me now. <laughs> All good points. Um, so, so in answer to your your question about the space domains, you're you're absolutely right. I want to capture as many different aspects of space as possible, and um, I'm actually writing your comments down very quickly so I can. But I mean, climate um, change. Nobody. I don't think I heard the expression climate change once in there. And you know, most of what we know about climate change come, has come yeah, from space. Yeah, it comes from space data. Yeah, yeah, like the um, like the Copernicus program as well. It's all cool. it's all related, and it's all super important to discuss, and is going to form an important part of of our our space group. Um, as I said, uh, we have so many things that we can do with this group that it's hard to fit them all on one slide. So I um, <laughs> I haven't mentioned everything. Um, in terms of diversity, uh, you're right, there is a, a RAL skew, R-A-L, that's the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, there is a RAL skew to this, and um, I have tried as hard as I can to cast my net as wide as possible to bring in as many different people from different parts of the country and, and different um, industries as possible, and I've, I've attended uh, networking events and um, uh, presented online and um, done all sorts, really, and yet a lot of the people that I know are within the, the walls of the building that we're currently broadcasting from. So there is a RAL skew and I am aware of that. But I think each person on this proposed committee brings something unique to this group, uh, something special. And um, as I also said, not everybody on the committee who, who has attempted to be on the committee is um, actually here present today. Some people are busy. Um, uh, attending other meetings. We have um, uh, one person who works at um, UMETSAT as well. We have a couple others as well. I can't remember all of them, but we, <laughs> we you're right. We do, not everybody in this room um, is, uh, well, there's a lot of RAL skew to this room. I've got one more question online before. I just want to answer John, yeah, actually. Go on. Just to say, uh, uh, John, it's Ruth Bamford here. Uh, so there are some oldies uh, associated <laughs> oh, with this. Although I am, of course, well. Oh, oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think uh, I think driving this uh, from the youth is actually promising, but uh, uh, they, they do have some input from us oldies. Thank you, Don. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If, if that's um, your question, I ask you to lower your virtual hand and I'll move on to the next person. So uh, the next person is called Taj. Um, please correct me if I pronounce that badly. Go ahead, Taj. Well, I've heard worse, so that's not too bad. Thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Tajinda Panasa. I'm the IOP's head of membership. My sincerest apologies. I was actually meant to be there in person, but circumstances meant I couldn't be there today. So, look, this is a group which we are very much supporting. I've been at the IOP for a very long time, and I think there have been discussions over many years 
about forming such a group. So, so to get to where we are today, I think is very, very encouraging as the IP is very supportive of that. I've got just a couple of comments. Um, the first is, so I understand that um, a proposal will go to the December meeting of, of the IOP's council. And I think in Alex, your, your comments, you touched upon RAS, and I know John Zemecki will be a former um, RAS president. If I was sitting on council playing the devil's Africa, I think one of the questions I would ask is, what kind of overlap are you expecting between the activities of the IOP space group and with RAS? Are there, are there overlaps which we will look to collaborate on or are there issues perhaps we, we, will may, we may just have to bear away from and allow them to kind of occupy that space? Um, pardon the pun. Uh, and the second comment I would make about EDI, and John is right to raise things about EDI, but look, you've got to start somewhere. In addition to EDI, we're also very, very, you know, we're, we're conscious of the fact we, we want the next generation coming through as well. So I'm quite heartened by the fact that there are quite a lot of um, early career researchers or, or slightly more mature than that sitting on this initial group committee. But you've got to start somewhere and that diversity will come in all forms as you progress over the years to come. And of course, we will support you all the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so one of your questions was about uh, overlap between the IOP Space Group and the Royal Aeronautical Society. I was wondering if maybe I could throw this question in, but you have contact. Yeah, I, I've spoken to a couple of people in the society uh, and unfortunately they didn't get back okay, to me today. So um, it's conversations that we're, we're trying to, uh, trying to get, get moving at the moment. Um, so I think, Knowing yes that, that that is a concern and that's something we want to we want to address and we're gonna we're gonna work at it and see in, in time hopefully for the proposal to go through. Yes, but, yeah, yeah. Good. Um, it's it's conversations that I've I've got started, but um, we're not there yet. Um, any other questions in the room? One online. If there's none in the room. Um, the next person is uh, Bill Evans. Um, hello there, uh, we've Hi. met before. Hi, um, I just say I think this is a great initiative and frankly, well overdue for the IOP, so glad to see it happening. Um, it was just a quick question. The, 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 the challenge with a group like this is that it's uh, technically and scientifically diverse potentially covering multiple multiple application areas and multiple areas of interest. The problem is the breadth and the diversity. Do you, do you have a sense of your priorities in the first 12 months or two years um, and uh, what you think the important things are and where you'd like to get to? Because I think spreading yourself too thinly is going to, going to be yeah. problematic. Yeah, that is a good point. Um, so as, as you say there is so much that can be done with a group like this. I think our first event, what, what I'm proposing is we, after this town hall event happens and after uh, the IOP December meeting happens, I would like to organize a launch event for this group to sort of widen our audience as quickly as possible um, within the, the space domain. And um, I, I foresee that as a, a hybrid style event, maybe similar to this. Um, so it's easy for people to attend um, either virtually or physically. Um, but alongside that, there's, there's a whole portfolio of activities that we can be doing. Um, and the, the, the risk that I run is that I, I don't, uh, I step back. I need to make sure that other people take charge as well. Um, so, um, my, my goal is once this group is up and running, I, I would I'd probably end up, um, having maybe three or four different key activities that we want to deliver within the first year and, um, maybe have a, a lead within the committee for each of those activities. Um, as for what those activities are, we have not yet had the discussion about what it is that is um, most important at this early phase of, of our existence. Um, but that's that's how I how I see things. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the room has anything to add to that. Oh, yeah, would you like? Yeah, come on, go to the front. Um, 
Yeah, I guess just to add to that as well, um, you, you're, you're absolutely right. I think it's it's a very broad subject, but I think that could work in our favour because it just gives us more opportunities to link up with other groups, as we said, you know, with the um, Royal Aeronautical Society, maybe the UK Space Agency. And I think this cross collaboration could be really, really valuable, just working together more and, um, yeah, just allowing us to, to network as well. So we're not just you know, one small self-contained group, but being able to branch out, I think that will be really rich and valuable. Yeah, exactly. Um, just a note, I said uh, Royal Aeronautical Society, but I've just been corrected on the comments they meant at Royal Astronomical Society. And at the moment, we don't have a, a direct contact there, um, but we, we can add them to the list of people we want to, to connect with, the groups we want to connect with. Um, yes, uh, so if there are any other questions online, please uh, raise your virtual hand or if there are any questions in the room, please go ahead. I don't have any questions queued at the moment. I have this one. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. What is the one thing you're most excited to do in the first year of this thing? Oh, um, that's a really good question. I think I'm just excited for this group to exist generally. Um, <laughs> like this group to exist <laughs> um, um, and when it does I, I have worked um, uh, what's the word agile in an agile way before and I, I, I think that that would work really well for us because we have such a wide scope it would help it would be beneficial for people to take their different leadership roles on, on the different um, ideas that we, we have proposals as, as activities that we can do. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything that they think was really exciting to focus on in the first year. I have a comment. Yeah, go on. I was not planning to say before, also in response to the question raised regarding the home in the, through the IOP. I think that one of the most important thing that we potentially do as a group is to, first of all, to discuss together and to try to focus on some specific area, because I agree, we could do whatever, yeah. but we have to start from something, other, otherwise we end up in doing nothing. That's the risk that I feel. So maybe networking uh, as a group and yeah. then promoting and launching, maybe launch events, as you suggested, for networking also with other people outside of the group and to promote the group and to try to think, uh, I mean, to start from this could be, I think, a, a good opportunity. And then I agree also with this idea. And then like the first thing will be networking in some way and agreeing to get a plan. That's I think the, the first practical thing to do. And then maybe also launching officially the group. I think it's definitely a very good idea. Collaboration with other society, absolutely and to see there are, and then maybe selecting a, a few, maybe also starting from the ideas of the committee members who could start by selecting, I don't know, one or two ideas also for events. I'm thinking to events as part of maybe in the frame of a conference, like a hub, or maybe something that would be like about physics, but at the, I mean, also the UK Space Agency as a conference, apart from that, and that would be like an opportunity yeah. for having a sort of IOP physics related event in the frame of the, of the conference, that could be an idea. And this is, could be a starting point. And then different people on the committee and maybe other people that could join the group later on will propose some specific ideas. Like, I don't know, in my case, I could say what, what they do, Healthcare applications of space. Have you ever thought that space can be used for healthcare? Wow, well, no, that's the right place for learning about it or whatever. And the second thing, this is about, uh, I would say, networking for professionals or anyway, people working in the industry or not in the industry, in the space sector, academia or industry. The second thing could be also regarding, as you say, students or graduates. So for early career people or anyway, physicists, just to let them know you're studying physics, there are opportunities, and the opportunities could be X, Y, Z. Yeah, just that was a, a really good point to raise. Um, I think we had one in-person question and two more queued up online. So yes, yeah, sure, yeah, John Bruin from Exeter. So um, just to say that um, in Exeter, we can help with the uh, climate physics, earth observation, fake analysis, sort of creative expertise into that. But also, secondly, with the IOP, you have access to the nations and branches as well. So you can actually quite naturally have a, a whole UK and Ireland coverage with that. So we aim to leave to that. So that 
in the conversation, isn't there? Because it's very much a convening year. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we have uh, one question online um, from Leah Nani. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, can you speak maybe closer to your microphone? Am I very quiet? Um, oh, that's better. I can hear you okay. now. Okay. Um, hi, sorry. Uh, I just it, there's there was a question in the the chat, and I apologize, Frank, for taking your question, but it, it doesn't seem to have received a response, and I thought it was quite interesting, um, which was about sort of international benchmarking of the group against um, similar groups in um, you know physics societies and other places. Uh, is is there a sort of plan for that, and ha has activity that other groups, either existing groups, are doing, or um, possibly contact with other other societies to see if they plan such a group um, has happened? Uh, so in answer to that question, um, no, we haven't done any international benchmarking, but we are keen to, to reach out to people that um, have relevant experiences. And um, yeah, so that, that's all I can say on that at the moment. Um, and then I, I see um, one question in the chat, which says, um, for in-person meetings and conferences, will there be um, any cost or fees? Um, most of the advertised IOP conferences have been very expensive and are unfeasible to go. And also is the proposed, proposed committee going to be voted in or just brought in? So two very good questions. Um, as we don't formally exist yet, we have not yet started planning any conferences or events. I cannot comment on if there are any um, fees associated. Um, but we, in order to reach as many different diverse audience members as possible, I don't want the cost to be a barrier for um, people to be reached by us. So um, we try to keep that in mind when we start planning our events. And in terms of if the proposed committee is going to be voted in or brought in, um, we're going to be following the IOP guidelines on how to do that. Um, I wonder if, Alison, do you have any comments on this? And if you do, can you say them on this side of the room? <laughs> So um, Alison is our um, IOP person in the room. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yes. Um, so this will be put to council in December. Um, and then initially it will go out for a call out for um, interested members to be voted into the group with consideration for those who have set up the initial, um, this initial meetings and also our meetings such as Alex and the team that are here today. Um, so yes, that's all I've said. Okay, Thanks. great. Um, and, uh, are there any other questions either in the room or um, online? If not, then we are about Ten minutes ahead of schedule, but we can move on to the final presentation from Professor John Broom. Or oh, we do have one question just come in, <laughs> as I'm calling. Uh, oh no, sorry, that wasn't there. That wasn't the question. So that's just a question. Yes. Okay. In that case, I'm going to um, hand over to John, who can uh, introduce yourself and and. Um, and your topic. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Can I sit here? Yeah, please do. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I mean, it's great to uh, be here with everyone and talking about these ideas. I mean, it's a really exciting stage of the formation of a, of a, a new science group on, on these things as well. So, and um, so on. So, I thought to, to share a bit about the things that. I find inspiration with, which is linked to science and physics and diversity. And, um, and also just to share some thoughts for about where the IOP is now and where, where sort of physics is and the 
and what I, what I think you know, opportunities for us as a as a community are in terms of leadership for 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 you know what is a national platform to do this type of group. So so yeah, so um so I've um I love wave mechanics. Okay, so I've got a nice sort of that animation up there is a there's a wave function of a wave just propagating down a wave guide and those who've done quantum mechanics, that's that's a wave function from a from solving an electron sort of wave function and that. But um, I sort of um, I originally did um, superconductivity and things in when I did my my PhD up at Langston University, looking at sort of uh, stochastic and messy superconductors and materials technology and the dynamics of that. And more recently, after, after you know, I've been working in this field for like 30 years, the wave mechanics, I moved into doing climate physics uh, about 15 years ago. Well, I, had a, I had a decade in industry doing data analytics, a lot about signal analysis that we all do, so as our bread and butter in many ways, just as relevant in industry as it is in academia. And, um, and there's some really unresolved questions in climate science about resolution and accuracy. And space has got such an important thing, the ability to observe, monitor the Earth system and accurately use that information. And that's where this, this picture to the right, that we took on, so based down in Exeter, this is on a local beach. And um, in that picture, we have the sea, the, the, you know, the, the sand, the clouds, and then you can see there's a moon on top, the full moon on top of that. That cloud there, and uh, those are all of the uh, the dominant components when you set up the equations of motion to understand the climate system and how energy flows around as well. And it's a really complicated system. Okay, what's what's challenging um, for the physics in this is compared to say doing electronic physics, where you can separate the wave function to space and time, and then you. Can have energy eigenvalues and energy levels, and we can handle and understand what the energy levels and then and the conduction properties. The equations for the climate system, you can't separate the wave function. So you, you kind of have to use sort of sophisticated numerical methods and approximations, but there's room to improve that vastly. So there's a lot of why we can do a lot already, there's a lot of skills needed to, to build that understand that and so space station is really important for that it's a very large scale planetary scale dynamics but you know and then but there's this lovely picture here I just took offline you've got the earth in the little dot here the magnetosphere around it the bow wave of the solar wind coming up it and these and then these ripples in the you know in the coming off from that the the scale of wave mechanics and understanding of that is really a you know a physics and engineering paradigm as well and uh, so bringing those skills in is something that naturally i see the space industry group and the space in group really help mobilize and energize that conversation as well there's a little diadem down there to do with electronic physics and things so yes yeah, so i'm so i'm based in in department of mathematics and statistics um, I've also been diversity champion at the University of Exeter. And um, so I, no, I had a, on a decade in industry, came back in to do academic sort of physics and stuff. But team dynamics is really important for solving modern large scale problems, as we know, in different areas. Diversity is almost like the number one thing. The physics is, is you know, factual, but it's how we form and build teams is, is really essential for that. I've also been um, chair of the physics committee group for the past, past four years and at the same time co-opted on to the women in physics group committee as well as part of this sort of this sort of EDI conversation as well. So oh, let me go back on there. So yeah and I thought I have some, some images, some physics images and, and a bit of um interactive stuff as well and um yeah and so so some questions really so um if you look at it for a few moments and um and then ask do you what 
some pop art image. What do these moments mean to you? Like you step through them and uh, please just fire out some questions, thoughts and ideas. Yeah. Um, if that was a cup of tea and you just poured milk in it, there could be some turbulence effect, which might link back to your sarcastic interests. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Storm the teacup. Yeah. Yes. In the turbulence. Yeah. Turbulence. Yeah. Turbulence. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's us sitting in a, in a little cafe with our three kids. We've got three grown kids. Kids now as well. And um, the top left image, does anyone know that comes from? It's an artist's impression. Uh, when the Cassini Humes. Um, satellite crashed into, into Saturn as well. This is supposed to be about four years ago now. That was the artist's impression of what it looked like the last its last few days. And and John Zanetti can tell you all about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's on? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. just the. I mean, the capability with modern electronics to monitor remote sensing is absolutely phenomenal. As well, and uh, and that's something I think that this group helps to table that at a, at a at a level that the IOP can 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 host as well. Then there's there's what would Elmer do? So there's there's a there's a there's a, there's a climate uh, conversation happening at the moment, which is really really big. Mm. It's not about it's not about social dynamics. So it's a lot of interaction with sociologists in this field as well as. As well as just the climate physics as well and what and the IP is you know, providing those conversations as well. And you've got this nice aurora there as well. I think there's a CME is due to hit the earth tomorrow, I think Tuesday. Might might not do anything, but I have my aurora alert thing keeping on my phone all the time. And my family, they 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 you know that it's become part of the popular imagination. Do I see an aurora at the moment? Does my enhanced image on my phone actually capture? Images. So there's this is part of the, the agenda of making it interesting and capturing that moment as well. There's um okay, those three suns. I mean, I've always loved science fiction stuff as well. It sort of reminded me of that sort of moment in one of the Star Wars films, looking out across the horizon thing. But this is me just taking the train into work, taking a picture through 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 the double glazing of the of the train, looking over the sea, going to Exeter as well. And uh, the bottom here, this fractal. Have people worked with fractals here? We've seen these popular. So this this image here, this is um, you get dendrites and things in electrical materials, sort of you get spanning, conducting paths and things, impurities. The the properties of something which is fractional like this is is a branch of statistical mechanics, which is. Understand that is essential for modern materials of modern dynamic systems and also in, in climate science, understanding of that. And there's some, there are some really amazing physical laws that come out of the understanding of stru this structure, this fractional structure. So that's why I concluded that. And then I've got this bottom right picture, this, this round disc. Anyone, anyone have any idea where that comes from as an image? Is it Star Trek? It's not Star Trek. It's not Star Trek. There's, you can see there's actually a Pac-Man cameo here. Yeah. Pac-Man cameo there, but it's... Star Wars? Not Star Wars. Tron. Tron. Yes. It comes from the original Tron film as well. And um, there is this minute Pac-Man cameo in this 1983 film about... It's more about the inter a future internet sort of world as well, but the amount of computing power used to create the images from that, the digital processing was absolutely phenomenal as well. And uh, I suppose that helped inspire me to go and do sort of electronics and things and then now we're into, into climate stuff. So, yeah, so so I moved into doing theoretical physics and um, analysis and communications. We're doing lecturing and applied data sciences is a big thing. So, so while physics, understanding solving physics problems is important, one big growth area at the moment is uh, data science, solving problems. We have uh, like a, over 100 master's students coming in every year at the moment at Exeter doing, doing data science. We're also building up the skill base of people who might then 
take a longer term career in, in engineering or physics, that there are a community of, pe of people who are practicing this area to be to be mindful of what makes it interesting to retain in their skill gaps that the showed us about. And um, I'm interested in sort of national policy, understanding and uh, how we explain the world. So STEM and diversity is just as important as the physical laws to this. And, uh, and as I said, I mentioned about the diversity champion next. So and I've been on the advisory board for the Livless campaign as well. And I'll share a bit about that in a while as well. Um, my sort of uh, physics area stuff is yeah, looking at fractals in, in the climate system. And then this bottom left picture here is um, that's a representation, what's the average of the entire ESA ocean color record, looking at the color of the ocean in terms of how green it is. So that's, that is like leaves on the trees, that is, that is microplankton. So it's the amount of chlorophyll pigment that you can see in space. And they obviously respire CO2 again and oxygen. So they're part of the CO2 pump. You can see there's different areas of the ocean, there's different biomes. The satellite sees just the, the, the surface optical layer, the top, I mean, three and 200 meters. So it doesn't capture the internal dynamics, but it does help to tell us about the, how nutrients get up wells to the top layer, which then gives more plankton or not. And because we have repeated time series and spatially, we can look at the spatial temporal data and help to integrate differential equations, which calibrate those together. So this plus the surface sea surface temperature data that's collected from satellites and altimetry data is essential for calibrating climate models and how we sort of link together really small scale, high frequency stuff and move it and look at the longer term stuff. And the one thing about climates, if you, if you look at spectral time series, it's a red noise system. So small scale always morphs into long scale and the slower time scales, naturally. So we have to calibrate that, how we represent that properly in theoretical and simulation models. And there's still room to improve that a lot. The Picture to the right there. This is um, here. There is a okay. This is a this is called a bifurcation diagram. It represents resonances in the Pacific Ocean, but it's actually a fractal. There are fractal standing waves, which which has got some spectral um, power that you can reproduce and identify. And which is quite amazing, really, and it explains the El Nino La Nina fluctuation of the temperature back and forth, and, the, and it, that regulates the whole interannual temperature of weather processes on the planet system. So that's part of some of the research that I work on. And bottom right here is looking at, say, rainfall patterns in sub Saharan Africa as well. And that is strongly regulated by how. how thermal energy is transported around the equator. So there's a lot of physics in this, but data science, measurement, interaction, team working, EDI, and non-linearity as well. So that's again, like the conversation about what, what is the convening emphasis of say a space industry group and it's, in some sense, I'd suggest it's almost like problem solving. What are what are the contemporary problems that the community is coming want to solve to hear that and to provide that that national platform to look at these? It's a bit like we have to do in climate science, which is obviously completely an interdisciplinary field. So come back to uh, so this particular one about so we, that's a nice picture there of um of Africa and then this is looking at the uh, the rainfall patterns in in Africa using using satellite data and the area there where where I've highlighted just here this is called the sub-Saharan Africa area it's an area 
between the deserts and the tropics, and it's, it produces a huge amount of food due to the rainfall patterns there. There's a, a vast population, and the population is due to grow to a billion as well. So there's big food security issues and migration, which is a, it's a social responsibility. Think about understanding the dynamic dynamics of this as well. And Earth observation data helps us get to grips with what are the what are the the intrinsic dynamics behind that. And it's a combination of theoretical models, earth observation analysis, on the ground measurements as well to cross calibrate it, and and also how to deal with um, missing data and missing um, and information in theoretical models. It, it's not always that accurate as well. So, and improving our understanding of how the how that rainfall pattern varies. And the bottom here left, you can see there's a seasonal, there's a seasonal, like a clockwork rain pattern, happens every year. But over over time, it's been getting it's been getting drier and drier, drier. So there's a there's the the drying of the of the Sahara deserts, you know, increased by anthropogenic fossil fuel burning as well. But you can see there's also decadal variation in this as well, which is connected to ocean processes and how they interact. So by better understanding that, you can look at phasing of when better support can be applied and more sources can be allocated. And then the bottom one is looking at the, at the extremes as well. So we've, we've had a hot summer, we've had a strict extreme rainfall. How society deals with, with catastrophic extremes as well is something that's really important that satellite Earth observation data can really help us to pinpoint the spatial extent our representative is and to, to help to analyze that. And there's a lot of questions still to answer about these type of fragility analysis or for doing that. But so like low Earth orbit observation capability can provide, can provide much more local accountability and, and monitoring areas that has been much harder to do from geostationary ones because it's, it's cheaper and more, and more quick to do so. So the opportunities of, of the space industry sector is, are vast in terms of just solving some of these problems and the, you know, the, or the other ones as well. And also, I mean, I'm interested in the theoretical properties, these little mechanics and different things to do with understanding, you know, just fundamental physics as well. And, and what's, you know, for those people who come into the space industry area as well, I want to pursue a much more in-depth career, looking at the fundamental constants of nature as well. And, and there's lots of scaling laws that, by having the resolution and the capability to monitor, it could be gravity sensors as well, to actually monitor those using the Earth as a platform to actually to detect and look at different things like precession, uh, angular momentum changes in the Earth and the, the atmosphere and things. There's an opportunity to have some really high technical long term career developments for scientists. In this area as well, so so you can so you can articulate quite a spectrum of of long term infrastructure and deep physics ones to engineering to applied climate science and interaction projects consortium projects as well. So, and I'd recommend just to create a group, but whilst you know you don't want to be too big. See what ideas come to the table from the community of interest that is is starting to emerge. So now to come to a bit about yeah this in inclusivity in 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 STEM as well and the uh, so the so the, the IP has been has been looking at the uh, 
and it's quite, I think, personally, I think it's very leading edge in terms of what is the conversation about inclusivity, who's, who is mentioned in this. And so the Limitless campaign is has been focusing, by design, looking at so younger, young, the younger community to, to start with. It's not limited to that, but the target audience has been understanding that many people get uh, preconceived ideas seeded of what it is to do physics you know, before they're 10, virtually. And so there's a lot of stereotypes that get embedded and then it and then it ends up with these, these surveys about being an astronaut or being a blogger as well, because it's like, well, I don't do that, I'd rather do this. So, so the IP has done this deep dive and looking at that and saying, so the Limitless campaign has, has, is an answer to that. There's a very large team, a talented team working on the campaigns around this, around social media and how to address that. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's been a real privilege to be invited to be part of doing that as well. And so I've also been working on the diverse stuff, you know, in my, in my academic role at Exeter as well. And so just to share some thoughts into, into, you know, the formation of this new collective that we have here as well. Um, just to think about what does, so what does diversity mean in STEM and physics? And, uh, and so we, we, we all come with a lot of different cultures of what physics or engineering actually means. And like the Fermi surface, you know, Curie, greenhouse effect, Newton's laws, radiative forcing, quantum Hall effect, quantum entanglement, something happening there. Hopefully, we don't lose our Hamiltonian Lagrangian dynamics. So physics has got it has a lot of narratives to do with the inventors of knowledge, and and it both helps but it also hinders. It's so long, you know it. it with the current setup, because it, it is a gender biased narrative, but also it prevents people who want to get involved in this. I don't really identify with this. So we as a community also have this, we need to think about how do we pitch our offerings when we're getting into the technical stuff? Well, yes, the physical laws and how it's important, but what, what's the everyday language we're going to put to make it so it's embedded and has long lasting interest to our younger audience and our, our more our sort of multiple gender audience as well. So we so we and we've all got a professional responsibility, I'd say, think about that in our groups when you're putting in a proposal and things and to say, have we have we included it enough? That doesn't mean to say you, we just completely get rid of all the old narratives and the formation of ideas is what physics is about. You can physical laws often are an idea. The thing to be aware of, as you know, with the, the wisdom of hindsight, is that some of these physical laws that have been have been discovered and articulated were probably a team of people, a lot of women were mentioned or or other, but you no know, one person got the credits and things as well. So it helps just to take a healthy rethink about the formation of knowledge because the teams we, we now work with, you know, are, are working in a shared environment where we also get shared uh, identity as well. So that's, that, and this is almost like a later phase of what limitless is that's in your mid career and things well. And that's, that means that you know, we have got to sort of think about those more reflexive questions. This is almost like when we're in our project management role, we're thinking about, oh, is, it, have, is, this, is this encompassing enough with, with enough forward trajectory as well? So those are the challenges that we face as well. And I know that like UKRI have really restructured and changed the whole interface to how we bid for grants and things to, to represent this narrative. So it's a, which is great to see, you know, let's say that that is happening. And so the next changes, how we all individually 
just to tweak our applications and things to to represent that. So I thought that was important to bring that to this to this chat today. And just one example of of that really is um we can just see in the, say popular culture that the uh, hidden figures of the you know the NASA work culture around the uh, the uh, space program in the nineteen sixties and seventies highlights about the invisibility of roles, but the importance of the skill, people who have the skills to actually solve things and to push through and to make sure things they do fly, they don't crash as well. And um, it's recognition is challenging for social reasons. And those social reasons don't go away just because that was 30 years ago. We, we've seen over the past few years no, a lot of those narratives still emerging. Well, and uh, but we're much more healthy for it as well. So, I think it's important for us to be mindful because this this space sector we're now moving into, I see, is a it is a very exciting new chapter for us. It is it's a very much a commercially led low Earth orbit, very engineering, a lot of fragmented capability and there's going to be a lot of rush to get stuff done and the opportunity of, of a national space industry group is also to provide a platform which is endorsed by the IOP the philosophy to say look, are we thinking about all of this is this is this going to have an embedded long lasting uplift to our national capability and and transform no, that interest so so in the future these think about these numbers I mean people might say I'm a I'm a YouTuber blogger in the space industry and then rather than being an astronaut you know I'm I'm part of this this matrix I'm really proud of it so that and that transformation requires a bit of this that it, and this is just as much management skills and that project management skills as well as the awareness as well. I want to re recommend is to team up with you know, other colleagues who maybe work on this as well and have a community of practice to discuss some of these. It can be challenging issues, but just mm -hmm. to have that awareness in it and, and by, by being part of the IOP, you have that naturally already as well. So come back a bit to science as well and this is one of the uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in is the one one of the biggest challenges of climate science is is how do we capture rapid change and, and very long term weather changes so over over centuries and, and, and decades of centuries. And the challenge is the instrumental era record is only 150 to 200 years old at most. So we've only got a short record compared to a 500 year climate record. So we can start to use proxies as well and calibrate that with instrumental era. And, and this, is, this is one proxy, which is I think more poetic literally. And this is a take, this is data taken from a, a, from a, a team we're working with in China. And, and they've used their, they've just used the uh, over 50,000 poems to derive the time of year when a particular uh, flower would, would go into bud. And that's and they calibrate it to leaf bud and ice melt things. So we have a record of the time of year when spring started in those different years, which I can apply a time series analysis to and look at it. And then you see there's this. This is dotted line to the right. When you, get, when you get a big, massive volcanic eruption, which includes the, uh, the, the, so, the solar, solar energy coming in, that was Mount Tambora in 1814. Massive eruption in Indonesia. And it, and it causes, you know, sort of so, so Turner was doing these paintings in Europe. It caused lots of famines across the world. It reduced the temperature for a couple of years. 
So that is obviously data which satellites haven't recorded, but we can tether the instantaneous dynamics of changes. So there was a, the eruption in the South Pacific a couple of years ago. We can tether satellite observations and records of that with our long-term records and actually get a, a fix on terms of what the low frequency aspects are, which is to do with energy transforming in the oceans and overturning. And by doing that, we can actually both, I think this is really interesting, we can actually look at long-term climate physics record, but you know, you can, you've got these very complex problems applied to you know, data analysis, real satellite calibration data things. So you can, so you can perhaps attract in people from different walks of life who might want to get involved in this as well. So and that's where, where the, one of my interests sort of lies in this. So yeah, so so I've shared what I think is some of the points which I think will help the formation of you know, this fantastic new group as well. And I said, happy to contribute and help the group from, from the extra perspective and, and this as well. And my personal thing is, you know, it's, it's so new, this current chapter is very fragmentary. It obviously, it would be member led and things, but finding a way of making sure you always have a national platform for what the ideas are converging to it means it could be transformative. I think that can help give you that resilience. Okay, thank you. And yeah, any questions, any extra thoughts, please just... Yeah, we are a few minutes early, so if there are any questions. Well, just uh, an observation following John's talk about it. So I think that's really important what you said about having that common messaging, like actually stepping back and recognizing what the, where the challenges are and getting people behind those individual challenges. I think that really helps sort of grow interest in, in people realizing what you're doing and then following following that piece. Because if you've got that narrative, even something like um sort of my history secondary school pupils big on climate change and wanting to do their part, but not realising the narrative where the data science comes from on climate change and actually the importance of satellites. I think if you can connect that, then you can really get that kind of full of people that they've got clarity, something tangible as to what they're setting out to achieve and the problems that you're trying to address for the group. That was really interesting. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. One science question. Do you look at the upper atmosphere variations or the drivers for the lower atmosphere? Because you can see the solar side coming yeah. some of your data. Yes. And so the I mean, part of the uh, so you can look at heat and climate sensitivity, look at the top atmosphere to lower atmosphere into ocean interaction. And uh, so yeah, the, the physics of that is is really important. So what do you call either onto the wrong way into space? The, the atmosphere, the mesosphere. Yeah, so I, I personally haven't looked at the electro, electromagnetic field parts of that. It's because. not necessarily electromagnetic, but it, the, yeah. the, the, because it's still largely dominated by the, by yeah. the uh, neutral atmosphere, but right. there's a lot of um, periodicities and waves that go on at a very large amplitude in, in that part of the uh, yeah. atmosphere yeah. that there's a way back. Yes. Like the downwards. Yes. Yeah. That so so that the so the technical aspects of modeling or un understanding the the uh, the whole Earth system from compared to what I when I've looked at that um, my electronic physics and how we measure it, sort of particle hole charge transfer and things and superconducting in really wires and things the the way we currently model the climate system is no way near as sophisticated as we do for modern electronics. Let's metaphysics. So, at the computational cost of, of simulating the upper atmosphere and the ocean, I mean, a, a, a sophisticated model might have 80 atmosphere layers, mm. 80 only, and maybe, and maybe 60 ocean layers. So, they're not going to pick up low frequency by having such a coarse discussion. 
so there so there are uh, so there's issues in terms of how do we move to the next generation that high modes which includes both stochastic excitation things and then low frequency wave propagation and with that discretization the discretization is 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 often too coarse to capture the low frequency variation we're talking about. So part of why I sort of moved into climate physics is to is to look at the full spectral analysis of high frequency low frequency dynamics and talk about both the theoretical and the observational properties to do it. And so so the uh, the collaborations I get involved in with that also involve working with paleo climate scientists who look at ice cores in Greenland or Antarctica and they do sediment cores at geographers as well and but and linking it to how we do signal analysis of the climate system and this and it's a key skill area that physicists are more used to do through analysis and spectral analysis um I find in the ge geographic areas, it's less, that skill base is not so strongly developed. Um, so we need this hybrid type of skill ability to, to analyze the units. And, but to come back to uh, the careers and the career gap, I think the, the, the other thing that's come up, say from the Limitless campaign, is, is also about sort of career mobility and you know, it takes it takes ten years to become a chartered physicist. So you know, degree, PhD, first first postdoc role, and then get accredited and things. And life happens, changes, and it's important to to ring fence that capability. Because now the research councils are doing that, so if you can be a chain that family come back ten years later, whatever, and really recognizing the value of having that. And you might want to then move from electronic physics into upper atmosphere physics and, and apply that, spend that 10 years there and then move somewhere else. So providing that, that sort of career mobility and that mindset into the diversity as well. I think the space, I think that's one of the, one of the strongest things that the space industry can do because it's, it's such a multi-diverse interest already. As well, so it can be quite leading in like that, and then problems like that can probably be more easily solved with that, that hybrid skill base. Hopefully, yeah. any other? There might be um, online questions. That's it. <coughs> What's that? The one online. There's one online. James CBZ. Oh yeah, JCZ. We asked him to oh, yeah. mute. Yeah. Ask a question. Uh, hi there, yeah, JCZ here. Uh, thanks, John. <laughs> Very interesting uh, thoughts. Um, I can't remember exactly what words you used, but you said something about we're entering a new and exciting era in space, or something like that. And yes. uh, I'm I'm always very wary when I hear that. You know, every decade or every new year seems to be new and exciting in space. Uh, you know, surely when we, you know, the first time Gagarin went into space or the first soft landing on Mars and, and images from the surface of Mars, first time we saw the um, uh, the nucleus of a comet, comet these, these are all pretty exciting. So... You know, and the future is more, always more exciting than the past because we don't know what the future's going to tell us, whereas the past we know and it's boring. But so, so I'm just challenging you to say, why is this any more new and exciting than any other? Uh, so, okay. Yes, good, great question as well. And um, I think the, um, the clue I picked up um, is, is it's to do with the commercialization of space. Really, the uh, we've moved from a sort of national space, space like NASA type launch things to it's much more about small industries scaling up to provide electronic sensors capability <clears throat> and linking with commercial launch platforms. So to especially to low Earth orbit, so the deployment rate I think is new is the new chapter, <clears throat> and the. The challenge is that it's more fragmentary. Uh, business will, will, will come and go bust. You know, there's, 
it's much more fragmentary. So, so with that, there's challenges, but there's much more scalability. Well, so I think that's that's why I, I've defined it as a new chapter, and it, it co-links in with us. We've just gone through the lockdown, post-lockdown, quite a transformation in our working culture. Most business meetings are teams or something now. We have a we're geared up to to work in a in a completely different, um, more inclusive way. Sometimes can have challenges as well. So together with all that and the interdisciplinary nature that is provided, I'm, and I'm using an optimistic new chapter definition, I think that's the opportunity that presents itself. And it's really about seizing that opportunity and providing enough leadership in that area. Does that help answer your question? Um, I hear what you say. <laughs> Thanks for your comments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, well, I think that's that, is that all the yeah. all the points. Well, thank you very much. Well, well, all right. Yeah. right, that brings us um about ten minutes to have a schedule, but to the end of the meeting. So thank you all in-person attendees for being here. Thank you all virtual attendees for being here and for everybody's questions as well. Um, hopefully we'll have some positive feedback about this, this group and its developments around December. Um, so fingers crossed and uh, thank you. And I, I will end the meeting now. <laughs>